Welcome, voice friends, to another episode of Interviews on Voice Matters. Today, we have Christy Knickerbocker, who is a speech-language pathologist in Fort Worth, Texas, and she has a private practice there called A Tempo Voice Center. And she also lectures on vocal health to area choirs and students. And she also, this is very cool, has a mobile video stroboscopy and fees company called Voice Diagnostics. And that's, that's really amazing. So I want to know more about that in a second, too. Um, Christy is also a member of ASHA, uh, the National Association of Teachers of Singing, and the Pan American Vocology Association. So thank you, Christy, for taking time to talk with us today. Thank you, Liz. I'm so happy to be here. Now, full disclosure, I found you because I was looking on the internet for straw phonation products, specifically things to help people learn about the straw and use it, and I came across your information. I thought it was really wonderful, and so reached out, and now we're talking, so thank you. And if anybody else wants to find Christy, she's got a really great web presence. She's on Pinterest, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. You can find her all over the place, so there's lots of great free information there for anybody who's interested, and um, yeah, we'll just kind of jump right in if it's okay with you. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. Um, so, serendipitous. Yeah. <laughs> serendipitous our meeting. I'm I'm very happy. <laughs> Me too. I love your work. I really do. Um, the first question that I ask everyone is how did you become interested in vocology? So how I became interested in vocology was a little serendipitous too, I think. Um, I was in high school. My senior year, I had just applied to Texas Christian University on, for a vocal scholarship, and I'd been accepted to school on that scholarship, and I was competing in, in high school, in Texas at least, you compete in the fall with something called TMEA, um, and you're doing choral pieces for audition. It's kind of scary, actually. You go in, and you go in the room, and there are judges behind this black trash bag you can't see them and you're supposed to do some sight singing excerpts and then um, what you've practiced, you practice the whole song and they choose however many measures for you to do. Um, in the spring you do UIL um, where you're doing solo and ensemble pieces. And so TMEA for uh, the fall of my senior year, things had gone really well, um, no issues. I was cheering at the time. So I was on varsity cheer squad um, school musicals, uh, choir, and then my extracurricular guitar gigs and singing gigs for that. Um, but spring came around, I was working on my solo piece and I couldn't hit the pitches anymore. And it wasn't that I didn't know what pitch to hit, but when I would sing, it would not come out correctly. I couldn't hold it. It would flip around. I'd never experienced anything like that in my life. It was very frightening. Um, so I started messing around with my larynx and I realized that I could sing it all really well if I just pushed on one side. So I went to competition, <laughs> standing up there singing like this, pushing on my larynx. And um, the judge said, well, that was so very nice. Um, why are you holding your neck? <laughs> you know, and so I had to tell her. And then of course she wanted to hear what I sounded like not holding my neck. And I sang and she said what I was afraid she would say, which was you need to probably go get checked out by an ENT. And so I did, and I just, it ended up being a cyst is what we thought it was. Um, and basically what we know about cysts and what I know now, they're probably not gonna go away with voice therapy. Um, so I had a surgeon take it out uh, and I had voice therapy, voice rehabilitation before surgery and after. Um, a gal named Amy Hamilton, it's Amy Hamilton Harris now, she works at UT Southwestern in Dallas now. Um, and I was set up with Dr. Sheila Allen at TCU on the road to rehabilitation, basically. So um, for, for anybody who does singing, you know that your juries are a place to showcase the work you've been trying very hard on. And I was basically doing nursery, you know, the equivalent of, I was doing vacai um, vocal exercise, vocalises for my jury, um, because it was just, I had to relearn how to sing again, um, which was very frustrating. Um, and... At one point, I think I was a year in, um, Dr. Allen came to me and she said, you know, you're not where you should have been starting at your freshman year, which I mean, was no secret to me. And she said, maybe it's time that you think about doing something else. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm devastated, you know, I'm thinking at this point, you know, what am I going to do now? Um, and so I was very upset and I was upset for many, many years after that. Um, 
but you know, you look, I look back on it now and I think, you know, that was the best thing she could have ever done for me because it's hard enough to be judged on your performance when you sing well, let alone if you know you're going to be prone to vocal injury moving forward. So bless her for doing that. Um, a hard conversation she had to have with somebody who, you know, and I'm a, I'm a kid. I'm, I didn't practice like I should have. Like if I were to go back now, I'd be much more studious. Um, but the, um, the bottom line was I didn't know what to do. And so I thought to myself, you know, I really enjoyed what Amy had done for me. And I think one of my biggest fears uh, going into voice therapy was that this Amy person, right? She would know nothing about singing. Is she a singer? You know, how is she going to help me? You, you think, because you hear speech therapy. And so I think that that poses this, uh, this issue with, confusion, especially that we treat dysphagia as well, but, but speech therapy, speech pathologists, that has nothing to do with, with voice, at least in the title. Um, and that's all I do. So I think this push that we have for the Pan American Vocology Association to bring this word vocology to where it's on everybody's lips, we understand what that is. Um, and you can consider yourself a vocologist because that's what you specialize in. Um, I think it would take part of that worry away, but, um, regardless, I, I wanted to help others knowing what it had felt like to be on the patient end of things. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. what got me interested and the rest is history. <laughs> so when did you decide specifically to go into speech language pathology? It was uh, coming up on, it was around the spring summertime of my, after I was finishing my freshman year of college. So oh. if you edit that, it, it was, <laughs> It's that uh, I decided to go into speech pathology, um, rounding out that last part of my freshman year, um, because I'd taken some some basic courses and I'd taken basic sign language, but most of my, um, or maybe that's what I did the next year. Um, I it was mostly music courses my freshman year. I was drowning in in music courses, and then of course it's like, well, what do you do with the rest of this thing? There's I don't think there's any way I could double major. I would have been, you know. I couldn't have really had a life. I couldn't have explored other things. Um, so I minored uh, in, in the vocal performance and just got my minor in music um, for that. And, you know, thinking about it now, it, it um, if I have time, if that's something I want to do, you know, going back and getting my MM um, would be something to, to strive for um, to kind of complete things. You know, you think about what you'd, <laughs> what you'd want to do. Um, do you have all the time? We talked earlier about, you know, the, the, the summer of ecology institute too so um but that's when yeah and then um when you when you were deciding to go into speech language pathology was there much voice specialization at that time or um were you did you feel like you were in i mean i'm assuming you wanted to work with voice right i did i knew that yes um i can't I can't remember when Chris Watts came to TCU, but I know it, it wasn't that early on. Um, and they had hired him and they hired a man named Raul Presas as well, um, who both had an interest in voice. Raul for the, the performance side um, and then Chris for the voice science side. So I feel like I really had a good, um, I had good access to to voice on different different planes um, at TCU, which was very fortunate. I had um, in in grad school even more so. It was um, it was the the ability for me to go to watch specifically voice clients from start to finish over and over and over to see what was normal, what was not, because as a student, you're not only taking in all of the data, but it's the day to day, you know, patient rapport with your patients, um, reviewing goals, having to monitor those types. There's so much that goes through your brain um, when you're a student versus when you're a professional, um, which not saying it's any less <laughs> uh, space taken up in your brain, but you're definitely not worried or nervous as a professional like you are as a student. Am I going to know these things? Because if you don't know, you know, you tell them, I don't know, and I'll, but I, I'll, I know where to look. Um, does that answer? Yeah, that, that does. question. It also leads me to another question about, you know, folks who are thinking about this profession or interested in voice science as a career. Um, it sounds like you got some great mentorship and you got to, you know, be right up close and personal. Um, 
that's very important, obviously. Is there anything else that you would say would be important for someone going into the field? Like what should they do? Who should they look for? I think a very important part, not, you know, in addition to having that mentor um, and then also experience too, um, is staying current on research practices because uh, speech pathology as a whole is, you know, you have that evidence-based, you know, the treatment triangle where, you, where evidence is part of it. Yes, your experience is part of it too. Um, but I, I enjoy the voice science part of it where I can say there were these research studies, you know, mull this around and consider this as an approach to how we're treating you in the therapy room um, versus just going off of someone's experience alone. Well, I've produced all of these very good singers I, my way is the only way. Um, there is something to be said for that, but I just, I have to make the case for, for research as well. And, and it's really hard to try and combine that. And that's main, one of the main reasons I, I try to be very present on social media with that research behind things. So it's, it's in bite-sized chunks so that you're not, oh, research is this big, scary thing. And these researchers are people. <laughs> they have questions. They have these burning desires to know why. Um, and it takes such a long time to think of something, to, to do the study, and then to write it up where it's even accepted for publication, where it's reviewed by other peers who do the same thing. It's this huge endeavor. Um, and as a student, I think you, you think, oh, these, these researchers, right? Who are these people? Um, but, but if you're, you're wanting to, be, to go into vocology, to go into voice science, um, read a research study a week, you know, try to read my blog. I, I, I lots of times will take a research study and create a blog. And that's another reason I kind of started the blog was to really teach myself um, to, to make myself read a research study and then put it in layman's terms so that I could, that could help me give that information to my patients, which is who really needs it. Um, that's why the research is being done. And so if we're not actively reading that and, and digesting it and then producing something in the treatment room, why are they doing it? I would suggest, you know, staying current, um, joining the, joining SIG3 from ASHA. Um, so um, PAVA, um, that's trying to do something that's worldwide. So uh, because you also think, oh, you're in your own little bubble in school, but there are people doing everything that you're doing in another language in a different country and it's happening all over the world all the time. Um, and so the sooner you can realize that, this, that's a huge amount of, of data you can pull from. Um, but uh, Michael Carnell, uh, the Iowa listserv, that's another thing I would suggest people do because if you're not responding to that listserv, you're at least getting those in your inbox. And it's usually something that's rare. That's wonderful. But, Thank you for those resources. And, and you're exactly right. If, if we just do a little bit of digging and sharing what we have, it's just, it's, it's worth every bit of work, I think. And so I love yeah. that blog is, is based on, you know, you teaching yourself and also sharing information with the world and being a translator and a sharer. And that's, that's what comes across in your, um, your internet presence very strongly, which is why I'm so excited to talk with you because I, I think, at least for me anyway, I feel like everyone can do a little tiny bit. And if we would all just mm -hmm. talk a little bit about it, it really does add up and it makes a difference. And you don't have to be you know, um, a genius at this stuff. It's just like, what do you love and oh. how can you share it? You know, does, do people know the word vocology? I think it's just, um, I think it's important for people to know that word, which is yeah. obviously why I'm doing these interviews. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I think what you're doing, is, I think what you're doing is great because it gives a little snippet of, of people that write all these papers and you can see what's really going through their head. You see them as real people because they are. Yeah. And they have questions. So. Yeah, exactly. And we're all in it together. Like we yeah. need you, we need voice teachers, we need researchers. It's like everybody is in the same pool and, yeah. uh, and everybody has a wonderful perspective that needs to be shared. So yeah, thank you for saying all that it was awesome. So <laughs> one of the things that I like about your work is that you've actually created your own products and uh, they're out there for sale and you're sharing them with people. Why did you decide to do that? That's a big deal. 
Well, there was nothing out there like it. And I say that with a grain of salt because Kitty Berlini Abbott has made um, Adventures in Voice, um, but you are, you have to take that course to have access to those things. Um, and what I was struggling with was you have all of these therapy tools from these big public super duper and lingua systems. They make all of these um, games and toys. And I was seeing um, this discrepancy in materials for kids who may have vocal nodules or a polyp. Um, they're overusing their voice. Uh, what do you do with them? And, and part of it was from doing my externship in a school, you, you are privy to knowing that these speech pathologists don't have a lot of time to prepare material. Um, these speech pathologists that work in the schools may not have taken a voice, had heard anything about voice therapy since graduate school. And you have different students at your table, maybe five at a time. Maybe one child has a, a, some articulation disorders, you have a language disorder, um, and then you have, oh no, this kid on my caseload who has a voice disorder, I have no idea what to do. And so you look um, online for things and there's nothing. There was nothing for, for all of the techniques that I had learned in graduate school that I knew were very beneficial. And I can remember a child very specifically when I was in my externship, um, they played card games. And I mean, that's fun. But I was thinking, what if he's really bored with this card game? Like, is he really like, how is the carryover for this? Right. I think if I remember right, like maybe he really did like the card games. Um, but I wanted to provide something that that was easily accessible for somebody who works in, you know, not in the main city. Um, and then that would have that research base to it so that they could learn, this is a technique, this is how we can apply this. And here's a game that'll keep my child very engaged, even if I'm having to flip back and forth in front of this table to work on Johnny's S and Susie's uh, WH questions, I can turn back and say, you know, give us your straw sound, you know? Um, and make it where it was very fun for for the kiddos and then it, it kind of blossomed from there i um i, I had so many ideas all at once and it, it takes a long time to make a, a pdf file i had to learn how to do it the right way because it takes a long time to make a pdf file uh, of the things you want to make. um and there's copyright for the clip art that you're having to figure out the rules on the on the terms of use for those things um, and so once you can figure that out and know that you're doing it the right way, then someone can look online, see this is what I need for my child and download it and print it off that, that same day. Um, and that was another thing is I like, I don't ship the, the hard goods because, um, that's not my point. My point is where you can have something that you can gain access to right away. Um, so I guess one of the early things that I made were these straw phonation characters where you, uh, they didn't have anything clip art wise, so I had to draw my own. Um, <laughs> and so, so you, you download this, you cut out the pieces, and then for each good straw phonation, you can add uh, a body part to the straw, and then you send it home with the patient so that they can practice it with their family. And, and each, each character has a story that goes with it. Um, and so that's just kind of a, a fun building activity. Other straw phonation activities include um, the mountain climbers. And so if you're thinking Ingo Tietze's straw phonation video, that's however many views it has on YouTube, um, you're doing something really, right? <laughs> it seems like it's so many. Um, so you download it and then you print off the cards and you start with um, just the kids going up the mountain with the straw sound. But uh, so like going up the mountain, you're wanting them to just do an upward pitch glide. Um, you also vary it with intensity. So you go up the mountain with your straw sounds and get quieter as you go up. So working that. And then I have them do a straw sound and then say a word and then do a straw sound and do a some connected speech, so doing some sentences, and then working for, for carryover. And all of my products come with game boards 
because that's a really common thing that um, that you're doing in the school and or private practice where you have a lot of kids doing it at once and then the main goal of the group session is is that we're all playing this game together so it's easy to add to that um, while we're on the subject of straw phonation, I the cut bubbles. So I have, you know, the idea of lax box where you're you're blowing into the water. Um, this just, I mean, nothing really scientifically awesome about this, just that it gives the kids a visual to work with the bubbles. So you're doing combinations of long and short bubbles. Um, you're wanting to get soft with your bubbles in the cup. And then it talks about uh, there's options for different pitches. So it just gives you a visual way to represent that skill instead of just saying, okay, we're going to do some straw sounds. Um, this gives the child uh, ability to kind of drive or lead the session and gives them power, empowers them. And then for resonant voice, um, I have the lemon muffins activity. So we all have that. My, uh, uh, my mom makes lemon muffins. Peter will keep at the peak the sentences. Um, so for the lemon muffins, I have um, they have the resonant voice uh, spatula, and so each time they're holding this, they're working on M sounds. We have the oven, where again, ease of use. So you just print this off and tape it to a box, so that you're actually having them put the muffins inside. So you're working meal and then you're having them put that into the oven um, if they do it correctly um, and then giving them the chance to make their own where they can fill in their M sentence again giving them that um, that area where they can lead the session and start applying it to things they might say in real life that and then I kept getting uh, inquiries for uh, how, how do I put all of these together? How do I know what's appropriate for each child? And so I made um, voice in a GIF, named that because it's hard out there when you're trying to see a bunch of patients. So um, the, the evidence is, the research studies are in the back, references for them to apply. It talks about um, flow phonation, it talks about resonant voice, and it talks about um, semi-occluded vocal tract exercises. Which if you think about it, that's I think what makes it confusing because resonant voice technically is a semi-occluded vocal tract exercise when you're doing a hum. Um, but it was always, I think the most confusing thing for me in school um, as a student was uh, there's so many different things you can do for voice therapy and I was and then, and then the lecture would go on and, and that's it and I'd say but you said there were so many things I don't understand I feel like I'm missing something so what I made was this um, this flow chart in the GIF book where it talks about stimulability which is again a huge part of our evaluation process where we're saying okay what is going to make a difference for this person? Um, so things like, does your patient have a breathy voice? If so, see if you can do a forward focused hum. If they sound a lot better, resonant voice is probably what you should try. Um, if your patient has a strained and strangled voice, um, does yawn sigh oh, improve things for your patient? If so, give flow phonation a try. And then it kind of gives a troubleshooting thing for that. I think that people have written me and said that that has really uh, made a difference as far as lessening confusion um, for what they're supposed to do and then which products would benefit their specific patient. That's wonderful. There's so much work to do. Like you're right. There's so much information. How do you use it? How do you apply it? Yeah. yeah. Organize yeah. it. That's great. Well, thank you so much for sharing all that. I'm, I'm really excited for people to see it and to, to know more about it. Cause well, that's another question too, is like, one of my big things is I would like to encourage younger folks to get in there, jump in the pool again and share what they know and get, get active. Um, what, yeah. would you, what, did, what advice would you give for somebody who's like wanting to do more social media stuff and have more of an internet presence? Um, we've already talked about like making sure that you're backing it up by research and, and really, you know, putting high quality information out there. Are, are there any other pointers you would give to somebody who wants to do this type of thing? I think what has helped me the most is, recognizing that you have to be very consistent with it and um, trying to make a brand where people are know what to expect. That's how you can gain more followers because if you're very, if you're all over the place, you're not going to gain a, a follower that's going to stick around for a while. If, if you keep producing something that's, that's very uh, predictable 
they know they can come here for high quality this, um, for funny things like that. It depends on, you know, what you're wanting to achieve, um, what you want people to follow you for. But, but I've found that long term for followers, um, if you're consistent, and that takes a lot of time. A lot of people think social media, you're just posting pictures, but I plan out a lot of what I do. Um, it's very rare that I will just post something spur of the moment. I do that, but, but, but knowing that if you start now, you won't wake up tomorrow and have all of these followers. <laughs> I think that was the hard thing, uh, is recognizing that you put in the hard work to begin with, and then you'll start seeing the benefits, but it may take a very long time. And so I think my advice to you, if you want to start doing that, um, is to not compare yourself to others. And I think that's very hard because you see the success of people, um, but you don't see how long they've been doing it. And you don't see the sacrifices they're making to make it happen on the internet. Um, it's not just magic and they may have lots of helpers that you don't have. Um, and so the other thing is to understand that it's a double-edged sword. Um, you put yourself out there and for as much good things that will come your way, you're gonna have people who don't like what you're doing and who can hide behind the computer and write you whatever they would like to write you about things that they don't like, things that they would do better. Um, the internet can be a very awesome place and it can also be a very uh, depressing place. So I would advise you to, as I try to take this advice myself, is to not let what the negative, the negative um, people say affect you. Um, and then also don't, don't confuse people trying to truly make you a better clinician because they're asking questions, um, as you being talked down to, or them saying you're stupid or them saying they do things better than you, because likely what's happened, I think lately, um, at least on Facebook has been these groups, um, speech therapy groups where someone will pose a question, which you think on Facebook, I mean, what are you really going to get? Yes, there are people out there who know their craft, but there's a lot of, I mean, who knows who's out there on those groups. Um, but they come there really looking for, for help because maybe they live somewhere where they don't have access to, to a mentor or um, maybe they're the only speech pathologist at their facility and they don't have resources. Um, and so then you have people jumping on there and asking questions on why they pose that question. And then it kind of becomes this jumping cat fight of, well, she wasn't asking this because she was, you know, she wanted this answer. But I think a lot of us try and help by asking questions because we're not wanting to say, here's the bread and the fish you can eat. Let me teach you how to get this answered yourself and to become a critical thinker in treatment management. Um, so, so just know that there's a difference between that if you're on social media um, but then uh, the good stuff comes too. And, and for all of those good comments, you can get 20 and then the, the negative one just, you dream about it, you go to sleep thinking about it. So um, I'm sure if it happens to me, I know it happens to other people. So I would have paid attention more. And this is just me. And I know everybody's different who's a singer. Um, if I'd have understood the science behind why are you doing those lip trolls to warm up? Um, if I knew, then I don't think I would have hated warm up so much or thought that I could get away with not doing them. Um, so I think the science behind it, at least for me, um, so I'm sure it's for others, but maybe not for every single person. Um, the science behind it is almost reason enough to do it. Yeah, agreed. I'm, I'm there with you. And also Ingo Tietze talks about that in his interview when he was taking voice oh, yay. lessons as a young man, like, why are we doing this? He, he just happened to be the type of guy that, you know, went ahead and figured out why we were doing that. So. And thank, thank, thank you for doing that because, I mean, people don't know who he is. And, and I always, I mean, I bring him up all the time um, and the work that he's doing. And it takes so much money and time, yeah. uh, money and time to do those studies. And so it, um, but the benefit is huge and it will last. And that's the thing is like, he's making an impact with what he's doing. Everybody is because those studies, they continue on. And then there are questions posed by those studies and it just continues to grow and we get more answers. Yep.
very exciting, which is why we all enjoy talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so one last question. Where do you see the field of voice science going? The, voice, the field of voice science and voice practice, I should say. I see it going, and I'm hoping I'm right about this, um, in an, a way where we are bridging the gap between vocal pedagogy and voice science. And um, I, I say this to both sides, uh, that we have to, not think that we know everything and be willing always to be open even if it's a couple days later <laughs> you're like maybe i don't know everything and i should have listened you know and, and you're more open at that point um but because there's never it's never too late to do that um but to not be so prideful about our training there is something to be proud of there though because you spent the time and and have studied a lot gotten lots of experience but um but to 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 work on bridging where as a voice teacher you're not afraid to call the speech pathologist and talk to him or her because maybe you're worried they know more than you um i will let you in on a secret i am always scared to call the voice teacher because i feel like because i had my voice minor i don't know everything there is to know that you might know if you got your you know you got your masters in music so um i will be the first to admit that and so um if you feel scared to do that or maybe you feel like there's no reason to do that because you know everything you know whatever it may be um i encourage you to uh to work on bridging that because the point is is helping the student helping the patient um learn more and we just have to get over the fact that um that there may be some disagreement. And I think agreeing that there is disagreement on hot topics like vocal fry and vocal register, and you don't wanna appear stupid because you don't know. And so you just say, this is the, an this is the answer. And then your students left to say, well, is it really the answer? Um, so I think that I'm hoping that, that Pava is going to help bridge that gap um, between teachers and scientists, um, but then also with rehabilitation specialists as well, so that we can all um, have a better understanding of terminology and how that differs um, and that we can understand um, where the other one's coming from. And I think we should all be open to being humbled by that. Yeah, that's where I'm hoping it will go. I see it doing so because of all that that Pav is going to do. And what a wonderful place to end the interview too. just remembering that if we all come to the table open minded and we can humble ourselves and keep our ears open and, and just have the courage to have the conversations with each other, we can all learn a ton. And, you know, um, that's the point of this interview, too. So thank you very much for your time. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. This has been great. And I hope that more people will watch this and will ask questions and not be scared. And um, I'm a human, <laughs> you're a human, you know, it's like we all have these same feelings, whether we say it out loud or not. Yep. Yep, exactly. Thank you so much, Christy. Thanks, Liz.